The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Wow, that is the new trailer for a documentary film that just dropped this weekend, and it's going to be broadcast on CCTV6. It is Blue Defensive Line, Lang Xian Fang Xian. Uh, it is really a, it looks like the trailer for Wolf Warrior 3, Comis. I mean, it is, I mean, it is just big blockbuster. But it, what it does, it's a movie about the Chinese peacekeepers in South Sudan. And it really feels like China is trying to use these types of documentaries and this type of media now to elevate and emphasize its military presence in Africa, particularly in a multilateral context. And again, in a way to contrast its own military engagement overseas from that of the United States and certain European countries. Today, we're going to be talking about China's military presence in West Africa. If you have joined us on some previous shows, you'll remember that we spoke with Zach Verton from the Brookings Institution about uh, China's role in Djibouti that also includes its military base that's there. But today we're going to look at it not from a U.S. perspective, but what's going on in Europe. And it seems, Kobus, that there's a very different set of calculations that Europeans have in terms of China's military presence in Africa than the U.S., Yes, it's you know kind of it, it seems like a different a different approach. The U.S. seems very very focused on containing Chinese activity in Africa and trying to lessen Chinese military engagement in Africa. Um, I think you know kind of and, and it'll be interesting to to discuss the the different perspective from Europe. Um, obviously, Europe also is on the hook for a lot of a lot of issues in West Africa. So you know like disruption in West Africa has direct bearing on migration to Europe. Um, so you know so it's an interesting it's interesting to discuss. It, you know, kind of in terms of, of a region that has more skin in the game, I think, than either China or the U.S. Well, there's a new paper that came out, uh, China's growing peace and security role in Africa, views from West Africa, implications for Europe. It was written by Tom Bays, a researcher at the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which is a German foundation. Uh, he wrote this while he was also a visiting fellow at the Mercator Institute for China Studies. Uh, Tom joins us for the first time from Berlin. A very good morning to you, Tom. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. And again, to kind of give us a different perspective on China's emerging security profile in Africa, it does seem to be in a period of change. Uh, you conducted 60 interviews with security practitioners, and uh, you did this across eight West African states. Why don't you go ahead and start by kind of laying out the thesis of your, your report? Yeah, well, I mean, as you've said, and as that um, as that trailer points, points out, that uh, the Beijing government is clearly intent on building out its military and uh, peace and security role in Africa and also quite keen that people know about it. And clearly there's a propaganda um, dimension at home with, with films like that trailer, but also clearly on an international level, they want people to know about it. So this report was obviously motivated by a desire to try and understand what exactly China is doing um, and why but also to try and look at how it's perceived as a security partner from the African, or in this case, West African perspective. And then as you've as you've trailed there in your introduction, also what the implications might be for Europe, given European actors' um, engagement in African and West African security affairs. So yes, yeah, so I conducted uh, fieldwork in eight West African countries. Um, that was um, interviews with a broad range of um, actors, so as you say, some security actors, so military officials, military officers, um, government officials, and also, interestingly, officials from 
the United Nations, African Union, or ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, so some of the other multilateral players who are involved in security affairs in the sub-region. So, um, in in your report, uh, which is really really fun to read, um, you you say that um, the greatest impact of China's growing security role in West Africa in the near future will not be in the security domain. Instead, it will be principally in diplomatic and geopolitical d- domains. Why do you feel that's that's the case? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for describing it as a fun read. I can't promise it's as exciting and dramatic as the movie trailer we've just been talking about, but uh, hopefully an interesting read nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, don't undersell the, yourself. Really, don't undersell <laughs> yourself. Um, but yes, no, I think that's right. That is ultimately the conclusion, the assessment I come to. That um, yes, this is a growing role, and I think this is an interesting and increasingly important dynamic within China-Africa relations, but also in terms of the impact on um, the situation in Africa and then also other um, non-African countries and regions, relationships with Africa. But nonetheless, I don't think that the the impact of China's quite broad security activities is going to fundamentally reshape security dynamics in Africa in the near future. That might vary a bit case to case. You take cases like South Sudan, where China is much more heavily involved, for example. But that I think the um, what I focus on a fair bit in the report is the fact that China's motives are quite clearly also very much political. You know, this is not just about um, protecting its economic interests or its citizens on the continent. That's, of course, those are, of course, important motives, but this is a lot about building China's relationships with African countries and then also, of course, demonstrating that China is this responsible great power, so building its influence on the world stage. So um, it's in those dimensions where I see this having the largest impact, particularly looking at it from a European perspective, because, as I say, that was one of the the goals with this report, was to look at the implications for European actors. So for them, I see more of an impact, say, within the United Nations, in the UN Security Council, or in other um, aspects of the UN system, where what China is doing in Africa across the board, but also increasingly specifically here with uh, peace and security affairs, it builds up China's political capital. And as we've seen, especially in recent recent months, uh, China's keen to cash in that political capital for political wins within the UN, you know, support from African uh, states for some of its policies, say in Xinjiang or Hong Kong and elsewhere, of course. Well, let's get specific and talk about how the footprint of China's military engagement is different in West Africa than it is in other parts of the continent. What makes that distinct? So we've seen, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's traditionally been Chinese peacekeepers have been engineering non-combat roles. Uh, However, in South Sudan, you pointed out, as we also heard from the trailer, uh, they've had a combat role. In Mali, they've taken on a police and a post-conflict resolution type of role, so a semi-combat type of of role. Uh, In Nigeria, it's in a weapons procurement role. It seems to be that that Chinese arms sales to Nigeria are going up quite a bit. Uh, The Chinese have been selling drones like the CH-3 and the CH-4 to Nigerian. There's also uh, frigates that are being sold, uh, small arms and whatnot. Can you talk to us a little bit about the the specifics to West Africa, even at the, the national level? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of the choice of looking at West Africa, there's some senses in which it can serve as a case study that sheds light on China's security engagement with the whole of the continent. But then at the same time, of course, uh, West Africa as a sub-region is quite different from the others. It has um, clearly different states and situations, different security dynamics, and of course, a different level of salience, strategic salience from the European perspective, as you mentioned in the introduction. But then also from a Chinese perspective, quite a different... um, story in terms of the level of Chinese engagement there if we look back over the last one or two or three decades. So it's in in many ways trailed behind the the depth of Chinese presence across the board relative to Southern or Eastern Africa. Um, Within the security domain, you see some of that coming across. So um, in some ways, China's activities in security affairs in West Africa are maybe a little bit shallower than some of the kind of things maybe we see in South Sudan or indeed in a different way in in, uh, Tanzania, for example. But what we do see is 
overall quite a uh, representative spread of China's engagement. So uh, we're talking, as you say, about extensive um, weapons sales, both small arms and light weapons, and then more major and, as you say, increasingly sophisticated things like drones. We're talking about um, quite a broad and and large and growing training activity. So lots of this capacity building, and then also dimensions like. Um, like the uh, peacekeeping presence. And there, I think that's interesting to contrast what China is doing in Mali and in South Sudan, as you've just mentioned. Um, so looking at peacekeeping for a moment then, in West Africa, China has participated in, in all of the UN peacekeeping operations since the start of the millennium that have taken place in West Africa. But if you look at the uh, specific contributions that China has made, we see it growing in scale, but also in type. So Mali was the first place where, where China sent armed infantry. So as you say, it's um, it's more of a um, contingent security force. So it's much smaller uh, numbers of armed infantry than in South Sudan. Uh, and that, I think, points to the degree of uh, economic interests at play in South Sudan relative to Mali for China. So, so yeah, overall, West Africa, I think it does serve as quite an interesting uh, case study that does shed light on the developments across the continent, but, of course, with some quite different um, dynamics. And, of course, in West Africa, some very, um, yes, significant, challenging um, security situations, of course, particularly in the Sahel. So, the um, you know, the, the trailer that Eric played, you know, really emphasizes China China's cooperation with the UN. Um, in West Africa, how does how does China's engagement break down between multilateral engagement, like through the UN, and you, you know, kind of bilateral engagement? Yeah, this is something that I think is is particularly interesting, and I think this is where the West African case study is particularly um, informative. So, of course, bilateral exchanges are really important. They're you know the bedrock of lots of these exchanges. So, the significant increase in Chinese military diplomacy, a lot of that by its nature is targeted at a bilateral level with specific. Uh, West African uh, militaries. So we're talking um, things like the increased number of military attaches, we're talking military um, diplomacy such as port visits, that sort of thing. So there is, of course, a significant amount of it that happens at the bilateral level. The UN dimension is, is of course, very important. And then in between, what we're seeing in the last few years, particularly since the last FOCAC, the Forum of China-Africa Cooperation in 2018, um, where peace and security cooperation was identified as a priority area, a fair amount of that is focused on building cooperation with the African Union. So a lot of that, of course, goes through ADIS. Um, but then because of the... Um, African peace and security architecture, a lot of that then translates from the AU level down to the sub-regions with ECOWAS in the case of West Africa. Um, and there, one thing that was, I think, quite striking was the limits to um, China's level of engagement with ECOWAS, which has been historically quite forward-leaning, quite activist in its approach to security affairs and, and where those overlap with democratic norms, for example, some of the interventions it's made, for example, going back a year or two to the Gambia, those are things where um, the norms don't really align with, with Beijing's approach. Um, so you can see a bit of a disconnect there. And then also in West Africa, what's interesting, you've got in the face of some of those urgent security crises, you've got other more novel multilateral structures, so particularly the G5 Sahel which brings together five of the countries um, in the Sahel region, two of which are not members of ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. And there too, we can see that China's approach is quite limited, um, but, but growing. What was striking there was that, that, that Beijing made its support for the G5 Sahel directly um, conditional on Burkina Faso, uh, one of the G5 members, ending its relations with Taiwan and only then after that you know that that pressure did succeed uh, and only then uh, after that has China moved to um, supporting the G5 but there looking at the detail a bit what's notable is that it's it's not so much 
funding or support for the G5's joint force, but rather for the member states. There is still this preference on the Chinese side to try and do things as much as possible on a bilateral level and in a way that keeps China's own contribution as visible as possible. Now, the G5 Sahel Force is an initiative that France is very involved in. And France looks at traditionally, and I just I can speak on from a French perspective because I've lived and worked in France for a long time, but I think it also applies to other European countries who look at China's military engagement with a high degree of suspicion in places like Africa. And that's for a couple of different reasons. One, there are broader geopolitical tensions between Europe and China, uh, disagreements over human rights, or geopolitics, lots of different issues. But in Africa in particular, it seems to be that there is still a legacy sentiment in many European countries that the continent, particularly the West Africa, is a traditional sphere of influence for European powers. And so when the Chinese are there, either in a multilateral capacity or now in a bilateral capacity, say in arms sales and training and capacity building, as you've talked about, uh, that would seem to me that it's quite threatening. Uh, for European powers. And I'm interested to hear the reaction that you've gotten in the discussions that you've had, whether it's the recent webinar you hosted, uh, or just in your discussions at the Conrad Adenauer Foundation and others, to the findings from your research about the Chinese presence, and what stakeholders in Germany, France, and elsewhere in Europe think about it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's also quite a big question, as we know, with um, the broader geostrategic developments, Okay, maybe Europe isn't um, in quite the same position vis-a-vis Beijing as as Washington increasingly is, but what's quite clear in conversations in Brussels, but also in um, other member state capitals, is that the um, yeah the mood is changing fairly significantly, and that increasingly I think does have an impact and a bearing on how European stakeholders perceive what China is doing in Africa. Um, there is nonetheless still. Um, Maybe a legacy. I mean, there's still a, a sense, actually, in which um, previously and to some extent still now, the EU and its member states look on Africa as a as a as a an area in which China and Europe share interests and can cooperate fruitfully, and that would include in security dimensions. So. There is still some sense of, you know, maybe we can work together and there's this scope for active cooperation. I think that might be shifting a fair bit now. You mentioned France, and of course, when we're talking about West Africa, it's natural to to think about France of, of naturally um, in the context of the Francophone countries in particular. And it is indeed interesting to see how that is perceived Um from a French perspective, and there too you see that mixture of um, belief that there is scope for cooperation, but then increasingly doubts about what that could look like. So um, Macron, for instance, has um, consistently in his interactions um, with Beijing encouraged um, China to support the G5 Sahel. Um, That's something that he's highlighted a number of times. But then when you talk about things like the weapons procurement dimension, in a lot of those markets, it's actually uh, French arms exports that might stand in direct competition with Chinese arms exports. So there's a, um, yes, a commercial or military industrial dimension that would say this is not necessarily good news from a French perspective. But I mean, when talking about West Africa, I think, it, and, and from a European perspective, I think it is important to also look a bit beyond France. I think what's striking in in recent years is the extent to which um, particularly the Sahel, but other security issues, other issues in West Africa have um, yes caught the attention of other European um, actors. So Germany would figure fairly high amongst that in terms of um, the level of German engagement in the Sahel um, in a number of different forms. But also the, the European Union itself um, has some very large programs, including um, sort of security sector reform, military training programs. You know, for example, in Mali, the, the EU uh, mission there has trained more than a third of Mali's armed forces. So there's quite a broad based European engagement with uh, security affairs in West Africa and some scope for 
positive cooperation with China. But from conversations I had, for example, in the fieldwork, talking to European diplomats, military attaches and other European observers present in, in those West African countries, they don't see much positive, uh, tangible cooperation taking place on the ground with their Chinese counterparts. And in, in your conversations with West African stakeholders, um, how, how seriously did they rate China as a, as a new military partner? So there, there's of course, as one would expect, there was a uh, there was a breadth of opinion. Um, I talked to quite um, diverse people, but there were um, definitely some sort of light motifs that that came out in some of those some commonalities in the way they perceived it. And yes, there's a recognition that China's role in general beyond the military sphere is growing significantly in West Africa, and this is also visible in in security cooperation. And there's this expectation that. China will play a larger role. And when talking to um, senior military officers, for example, they're seeing greater, um, you know, greater degrees of exchange with Chinese counterparts, be it um, training programs which are growing significantly or other forms of, you know, interaction with the, with the local Chinese military attaches, for example. But the views views that came across quite commonly were a recognition that China's role is more limited. So in terms of what a security, a non-African or an international security partner can offer, um, there are limits to what China is willing to do. Now, of course, external intervention is not the preferred plan A option, but the fact that China is either unwilling or un unable to perform the kind of intervention that France did in, in Mali um, in, back in 2013-14, um, or indeed the UK and Sierra Leone going back a couple of decades. So that, for a lot of my interlocutors, did um, limit China, China's role and status when it comes to those, you know, in extremist interventions. And then on the more kind of day-to-day, -day, say, the day-to-day -day level of um, arms procurement, training, that sort of thing. Another point that came out frequently was China is just one of a number of partners in these different dimensions. So the Anglophone countries in West Africa, for example, have a lot of um, security military training exchanges with countries like India. So China is, for them, in some ways, comparable to those players and is not necessarily the most, um, you know, prestigious trainer, for example. And there were doubts about, well, what kind of, how much relevant ex experience and expertise does China really have, say, on counterterrorism? Um, so doubts about that, doubts also about the quality of, of China's we Chinese weapons. So in some, the view is, yes, it's a growing role, and could be significant, but it's nonetheless not yet a, a it's certainly not a first choice security partner. And even when it comes to looking at alternative security partners, it's Russia that gets mentioned more commonly than China. I, I want to kind of address two points and then go come back to the quality issue that you talked about in terms of weapons. I think you were being a little bit subtle in terms of China's opposition to interventions. And I think it, what we've been hearing now over the past few, say, two or three months from Foreign Minister Wang Yi is a firm objection to any type of foreign intervention in a place like Libya. So it came up and it was one of the key themes at the China Arab Foreign Ministers Conference that took place last month, which was a repetition of how China will not support any foreign intervention in Libya. Now, I think they were kind of throwing some shade towards the Turks and others, but it was also a message to Europe and the United States. In, in my opinion, everything goes through that filter of, you know, really... You know, they, they, they were scarred by what happened in Libya with Resolution 1973 back, uh, you know, about 10 years ago in terms of that intervention. And that is something that they don't want to do. So I think what I'm hearing more and more is that the Chinese are really going to stand up for non-intervention on military affairs in Africa. Uh, and that goes to the French who, again, you know, went into the Central African Republic without any UN mandate. So there's a lot of pieces on the table here that, that I think are, are in play here. On the question of procurement and weapons, I want to bring your attention to Defense News Nigeria. This is a blogger on Twitter that I follow. You can follow him at Defense Nigeria. 
He's really, really interesting. And he, he tweeted back on July 21st, when you look at the caliber of weapons Nigeria has acquired in the last decade, the JF-17, which is the JFONG-17, that's a fighter jet, the CH-3A attack drone, VT-4 a ta- a tank, the SH-105 wheeled howitzer, ST-1 tank destroyer, F-7N1 fighter jet, and satellite launches, you realize that without China, Africa will be at the mercy of the West. And I just thought that was a really interesting point of view. So on the one hand, the Chinese, you talked about some quality issues that came up in your research. But on the other hand, the price of Chinese technology is so much cheaper than comparable gear from U.S. and Europe that a lot of countries are opting to choose Chinese hardware simply because it's cheaper. And to that point, I'd like to get your comment on the fact that Donald Trump just last week has uh, relaxed uh, the restrictions for selling attack drones, in part because of the success that the CH-3A and the CH-4, these are Chinese attack drones, have had in places like Nigeria. So interesting in terms of the trade-off between quality and price and how popular Chinese equipment is, is in places like West Africa. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's it's quite right to take a, um, a nuanced perspective in the sense that what China can offer is um, higher capabilities at more accessible prices for militaries in West Africa that are facing very serious challenges. Um, and that would include, of course, the Nigerians, but not, not just. You know, many of the uh, militaries in the region are either directly facing um, um, jihadist and terrorist threats or also engaged in neighbouring countries in peacekeeping operations. So um, there's a sense in which enabling those militaries to have better capabilities at an accessible price would seem to be a positive opportunity. That question of quality, though, that um, that does come up, that's something that um, I was keen to explore going into this report because it's something that, say, the commander of US Africom has pointed to in the past. And there's a, te- you know, there's a temptation to say, well, of course he's going to say that from an American perspective, but um, there's there's plenty of evidence talking to um, some of the the militaries and the ministries of defence uh, involved in some of these procurement and actually using the weapons. It's clear that there have been problems. Um, so there is a there is a trade off that needs to be considered, and and certainly my interlocutors are aware of that. Um, as I highlight in the report. Uh, China has customers for these weapons throughout the region, but Nigeria and Ghana are particularly significant um, uh, customers for China, for Chinese weapons. Um, And you you gave a list of some very good examples and quite significant examples in terms of uh, the capabilities that 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 brings to the, the recipient militaries. But Yes, fundamentally, only if it works. And some of the uh, military officials and officers I spoke to um, expressed fairly strong um, frustration, dissatisfaction at some of the performance issues and, um, yes, a preference not to continue acquiring Chinese weapons. I think that this, it varies across the board. I think that smaller arms and light weapons are maybe more reliable than the larger systems. Um, and of course, one dimension of all of this is that the Chinese military industry is modernizing and these sorts of sales and therefore the actual combat usage and experience these weapons and systems are getting will have a feedback effect. That's something that the Chinese side is actively seeking to improve uh, their output. Um, a final point, I suppose I would say, is that um, the there are other suppliers there is uh, you've mentioned the us and uh, european suppliers um but also in a um, in the same sort of price range as china russia is of course a big um, competitor russia is the number one exporter whereas china comes in second uh, and often china is selling uh, some you know Soviet legacy models, but you know the Chinese versions of them, the Chinese equivalents of the Kalashnikov rifles, for example. So there are other competitors in the mix: Ukraine, uh, Czechia, the Czech Republic. Um, so yeah, I think there's um, a variety of di- there's a there's a range of dimensions to China's growing uh, role. Some of it, of course, positive; others less promising. <laughs> 
Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. We've seen over the last two or three years um, really a rise in piracy off the coast of West Africa, um, and also including you know some Chinese vessels, particularly fishing vessels, also being targeted. Uh, do you foresee China working on piracy as an issue the way that it has uh, in a kind of a multilateral capacity off the coast of East Africa? So I explore that in the report, and and basically no, it would be the short answer insofar as the nature of the, although it bears the same name, piracy, counter piracy, the nature of the issues and challenges um, in the Gulf of Guinea off West Africa are quite different from off the Horn of Africa. So it seems to demand quite different responses. But even within what is going on, so there are multilateral structures in place, including uh, extra regional players. So the uh, the G7 plus plus friends of the Gulf of Guinea structure. China is not part of that. So, although it has been, for example, it's in the last few years on a number of occasions used its um, uh, rotating presidency of the UN Security Council to draw attention to the Gulf of Guinea piracy issue, um, and has stated that China is actively supporting naval capabilities, coast guard capabilities in the in the sub-region. There's certainly on the multilateral level, there's not so much. And certainly in terms of active patrolling by Chinese um, naval assets, that doesn't seem to be on the cards. And you mentioned the Chinese involvement in illegal and overfishing. Um, while China is not the only um, party guilty of that in the uh, coastal waters off, um, you know, in the Gulf of Guinea, it is a very significant player. And quite often in my conversations in, in those coastal states, when the conversation then turns to Gulf of Guinea issues, what comes up is not China's positive, potentially positive contributions to anti-piracy, but its um, fishing fleet's worrying, damaging role in, in illegal fishing. So certainly there, that's, that's a good case where we can see a Chinese attempt to present its um, contribution as, as positive, but being undermined by other Chinese actors that are exacerbating the situation. Yeah, that's fascinating. You, you talked about in the report how Beijing is hoping to deepen its, re, its relations with African militaries, in part also to protect its burgeoning economic interests in over one million citizens on the continent. Yet despite that, we, and we've been hearing that for years since the opening of the Djibouti base, that it was there to potentially protect people and property. Uh, back in 2015, uh, Xi Jinping pushed through a new law, the new anti-terrorism law that did allow under certain circumstances Chinese special forces to intervene in other countries. That was some kind of jujitsu with their non-intervention thinking as well on that. But yet we still continue to see Chinese t- being taken hostage especially in the Gulf of Guinea, but also on land uh, in Nigeria. It, there's a number of hostage taking that now. But we're not going to see this wolf warrior to Wu Jin swoop in, you know, with a bunch of guns and the, the Chinese Navy sending in the Delta Force in order to rescue Chinese nationals who have been kidnapped, or if there's an attack on a Chinese uh, facility somewhere in West Africa, because that, it seems like, would then unleash a whole bunch of issues about non-intervention on the Chinese side, but also about militarism on the African side. And Lord knows what the U.S. and Europe would say as well. So with all of that in mind, this idea of them using military force to protect people and property when those forces are either bound by multilateralism under the U.N. flag or they're bound by their own non-intervention limitations, is that really something we should be thinking about yeah, I think what's what's really striking is when you look at things like Wolf Warrior Two, and that what's clearly an active um, effort to um, raise uh, raise awareness amongst the Chinese people of these kind of military endeavors is you know what, how is that raising expectations and can those expectations be be matched? As you say, those kinds of kidnappings and other problems do continue to to take place um 
and it doesn't lead to the kind of intervention that the kind of Hollywood style Wolf Warrior 2 would encourage you to expect. Um, I think that the um, the question of Chinese interventionism remains in some degree of flux. You mentioned Wang Yi's statements regarding Libya. Of course, the um, Chinese, the Beijing view of intervention remains um, fundamentally sceptical and hesitant, but it is right that we recognise that it has developed, it has become somewhat more nuanced in the last decade or two, but that doesn't mean that there's a willingness to, um, yes, to intervene at the drop of a hat. Uh, but I, what I do think is an interesting, potentially interesting development is the the creation, the registration of um, the eight thousand strong Chinese peacekeeping standby standby force. It remains to be seen how that could be used, but there are possible scenarios where, um, you say, if we're in a situation comparable to situation in in Mali a few years ago where a multilateral, be it African Union or United Nations, mission isn't able to deploy quick enough, and that's what led to the French um, role. Is there a scenario where China's peacekeeping standby force can then be the, the kind of the vanguard of what would then eventually become a multilateral peacekeeping operation? So I, I think there's those questions remain, and I think we, we will only know more about that as situations arise in the coming years. What I would say as well, though, is that okay, with those smaller scale um, um, incidents such as as kidnappings, there are limits to to what any military would do or be willing to do. Um, the question of protecting citizens and and economic assets comes into play maybe a little bit more with the non-combatant evacuation operations. Libya was a a big step um, in that regard in terms of using PLA capabilities to evacuate Chinese citizens in very large numbers. So, um, yes, I think a lot of this just remains open. It's interesting to see some of the developments in the last few years and the directions that that might point us in, but we'll have to wait and see. How much appetite do you feel is there on all three sides, on the European, African and Chinese sides, for for kind of external cooperation in West Africa? Like, is, is you know, is there a, a kind of a drumbeat for people who want to, the Chinese and the Europeans to work together? Um, or is that actually relatively down on the list of priorities? I would say from the European side, there is an appetite for that kind of cooperation. I suppose there's a... I would say more of a problem solving centric approach on the European with the European thinking and a view that, well, okay, China's um presence, footprint, influence, those are all growing in Africa, in West Africa. So China has potentially a role to play and could um, you know, deploy its its strengths, its assets to help solve some of these challenges. And that view is shared also by some of the West African interlocutors I spoke to. It depends a little bit on the particular realm of activity we're talking about. There are dimensions where, from an African perspective, quite soundly, quite rightly, well, there's there's benefits from um, getting the best deal that one can get in more, a more competitive environment between different external partners. And then on the Chinese side, what's interesting is you know, the talk of trilateral cooperation, which is something that has been explored or proposed, and there have been elements of this. So, for example, Europe, China, Africa, trilateral cooperation uh, in Addis to do with um, small arms and light weapons um, trading and increased transparency in that area. But broadly, the the Chinese view has been hesitant and sceptical about this trilateral uh, set up what's in it for them and if they're involved in this kind of trilateral um, cooperation where one of the three corners is either Europe or America you know what does China gain from being associated overtly with um, other players that are of course have colonial or perhaps neo-colonial legacies that um, China is quite keen clearly to not be associated with um, so 
there's there, there would appear to be little prospect for much more active trilateral cooperation on these issues, but um, there are nonetheless still those who, who seek it on uh, different sides. And I think one of the conclusions I come to from a European perspective is that um, pragmatically, China does have this growing weight and influence on the African continent, and it's um, it would be necessary to to achieve some degree of coordination to at least have a shared understanding of some of these developments as they come up, how to respond to crises or problematic developments. The paper is China's Growing Peace and Security Role in Africa, Views from West Africa, Implications for Europe. It is available on the Merix website. Merix is M-E-R-I-C-S dot O-R-G. Uh, look it up and you can look for Tom Bays, who's a researcher at the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Uh, he's calling us from Berlin. He wrote this while he was a visiting fellow at the Mercator Institute for China Studies. Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to share some of the insights from your research if people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days, are you on social media? I'm not actively uh, present on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Put it that wow. way. Wow. Cobus, we have not heard that from a, a scholar in a long time, actually. He is the, this is, uh, this is quite but remarkable. It's, it's true for many scholars, <laughs> It I is still true. Tom, I'm very proud of you, actually, that you've stayed out of the cesspool that is Twitter <laughs> these days. So, uh, but we will nonetheless put the links down for the paper in, in the show notes. Uh, Tom Bays, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Kobus, it was interesting listening to Tom because I kept reflecting back on the series of discussions that we've been having over the past several months with Lena Ben Abdallah, who wrote a new book on military to military cooperation, Zach Verton at the Brookings Institution, who we spoke with about the, the relationship in the Red Sea and military engagement in Djibouti. And it all seems to be part of a narrative that's emerging that China itself is not going to be a top tier or a tier one military partner for most African countries, the way that, say, the United States and Europe are today. So the United States with AFRICOM is on the ground, training soldiers, training officers, very hands-on, uh, is, is a much bigger presence on, in the country, whereas the Chinese are obviously playing in a multilateral role, but they're not doing the one-on-one. -on -one. Their equipment still has a lot of issues. That being said, the U.S. equipment is very, very expensive, oftentimes very complicated. I mean, there's no way that a country like Zambia, for example, can handle an F-35, an F-18. These are these require, uh, you know, software systems and maintenance and technologies that are just beyond the capacity of most African militaries. But that being said, it feels like a tier one partner like the European Union, France, uh, to some extent Germany, but certainly the United States, is very different than what the Chinese are doing in Africa. But it is interesting because I think it is changing very, very quickly. Yes, it's certainly changing a lot. And China clearly has, you know, is, is, would like to position itself as more of a, of a you know, a kind of a, a multi-platform partner, I guess, or, you know, kind of a, a, a wide-ranging partner. But it's also interesting is or striking for me how relatively modest this role is particularly against the context or in, in in the context of how it's being portrayed particularly in the US at the moment you know the, so you're hearing so many um, US stakeholders literally basically ex, you know um, accusing China of of full on expansionism you know just just basically saying like China wants to just you know could just rule the world basically and you know when you look at the actual breakdown of what this what this kind of military role is it's actually relatively modest it's it's very modest and it's not at all aligned with the rhetoric uh, what we were talking about today is that i i featured in our newsletter today uh, comments, and I'm looking them up right now, from Congressman from Tennessee, a Republican congressman, who Tim Burchett, who was in a House uh, subcommittee on African Affairs meeting, and he talked about how the, uh, the Chinese want global domination. And again, that just does not align with the military footprint of the United States with more than a thousand facilities around the world and China and its one. Also, the Chinese technology is not as good. Uh, Chinese command and control systems, supply chains are nowhere near what the Pentagon has. But yet the fear is, is really quite remarkable. One other point to talk about when it comes to military issues is the Chinese may not be able to compete with the United States head on in terms of a direct military conflict or to replicate what the United States or Europe are doing in places like Africa in terms of training. We didn't get into the cyber component, 
But when you look at Chinese military thinking today, so much of it is an asymmetrical type of approach that is not necessarily going head on with to attack an opponent, but using, again, strength like... I'm trying to find an example that would apply in Africa, but asymmetrical warfare is really the approach that the Chinese are doing. And I think that there's probably a lot of conversations uh, like that going on in Africa. And again, I would love to be able to talk to a military cyber warfare person to see if the Chinese are doing any training on that front, because that's where they do have, I think, a comparable capability to the United States and others. Yes, I completely agree. And it would also be really fascinating to talk uh, with African military experts in terms of the ranking of different external partners to African militaries. You know, like where does Russia stand, for example? Um, you know, and, and, and all of these emerging partners. That, um, so I think that's re it's really important to kind of to, to lay out the entire landscape. And hopefully we'll be able to do that in a later episode. One of the political considerations to think about going forward is there's a real bitter fight going on in the United States today about whether or not AFRICOM should remain engaged in Africa or those troops should be redeployed and the budgets redeployed to, say, here in the Asia-Pacific region to confront China more directly. And so they, they fought back the Trump administration, that is the, the military industrial complex, the Pentagon. There's a lot of people who push back. Congress was very aggressive in pushing back to not redeploy the troops out of Africa. But they may not be able to hold that line forever. And if the troops are redeployed out of Africa and the budgets are, are moved as well, that could present an opening for China to do more. Again, not necessarily to fill it one to one, but certainly to be able to expand their military influence in places like West Africa as we talked about today. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of the show. We have these types of discussions every single day going on in our newsletter. If you're a China Africa professional like Tom, or you're a journalist or a scholar, or you're just really interested in the news and by the fact that you've made it all the way till the end of this podcast means you are a dedicated listener. Uh, we would love to have you part of our growing community of readers around the world. Uh, go ahead to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe, enter the promo code podcast, and we'll give you a big, juicy, giant discount, a third off the subscription price. It's a, just a surprise for our listeners who get to the end of the show. It's a little gift that we love, we love to give out. And we've been very, very grateful to all of our podcast listeners who have signed up in recent weeks. Not only are are you getting a great newsletter, which we're very proud of, but you're also supporting independent journalism, which also we think is something that's very important in today's uh, age. And so that'll do it for the show. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at e. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.